Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Dr. Elisa Alvarado with Region 1 Education Service Center. And it is my pleasure today to host the Health Science Panel. Um, one of the reasons that um, I was excited about this panel is because we have representation from the workforce, we have representation from the university, and of course we have representation from our partner, Doctors Hospital. So what I wanna do is just start off with some introductions. And after the introductions, uh, we will get to some questions. If during the time that we are presenting, you have questions or you would like us to ask some questions, uh, please use your chat feature and we will be filtering the questions as we go. Uh, that being said, um, really quickly, uh, my panel, uh, we have Mr. David Gutierrez. Gutierrez with the Texas Workforce, um, Dr. Christopher Lettingham with UTRDV, Dr. Rao with um, DHR and specifically the Department of research and then of course we have Dr. Cardenas. Dr. Cardenas has actually joined us uh, several times before so uh, we're excited to have him back. Um, so I just want to start off with introductions from the actual panelists themselves. So if we could start with you David. Sure, uh, my name is David Gutierrez. I work with the Workforce Solutions Lower Rio. My title is Education Relations Supervisor. I work very closely with the school districts here in Star, Hidalgo, and uh, Willacy counties. And David, how long have you been with the workforce? I've been with the workforce for over 20 years. Uh, the current position I've been in uh, for about three years, working with a team of workforce outreach specialists, and what we focus on is getting the information on labor market information to the students, uh, sixth grade to 12th, to let them know what is actually in demand so they can make more, uh, better uh, decisions and careers uh, what we want to avoid is them choosing a career that we're not, they can't find employment at here in the area. Uh, so this is perfect because healthcare is one of the top industries, if not the top industry in the area. So uh, we're happy to be here and, and provide any information we can. Thank perfect. you. Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. And Dr. Lettingham. Hi, my name is Dr. Christopher Lettingham. I'm the Senior Associate Dean in the College of Health Professions at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. I have been with the university since we opened UTRGV, so we're wrapping up our fifth full year of UTRGV, but I've been in the Valley for 14 years, educating tomorrow's healthcare team, which is our motto in the College of Health Professions. Perfect, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Dr. Rao? Um, I'm Dr. Sohel Rao. I'm the president and CEO of DHR Health Institute for Research and Development. Um, I was actually, I came to the Valley about a little over two years ago to establish a non-for-profit uh, research institute, uh, which actually currently is involved in over 150 uh, clinical trials. Uh, 17 of those clinical trials happen to be in the area of uh, COVID-19 in various, ac both acute and chronic uh, phases of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, working with our physicians here uh, at DHR Health and at 10 other uh, hospital partners. Uh, we have actually established a Rio Grande Valley collaborative for early diagnosis and prevention of uh, COVID-19. And through that particular collaborative, we have been able, and we are very proud of it, that DHR has taken a lead in providing transfusion to over 4,000 patients uh, who have uh, uh, been infected with COVID. We brought in monoclonal antibodies into, uh, into the region. We brought in remdesivir into the region. We are now actually part, I'm the PI of a NIH-funded study, which is actually bringing uh, uh, some really uh, uh, innovative uh, b molecules to treat COVID-19, both in its acute phase and also in its chronic uh, complications. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Dr. Cardenas. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Carlos Cardenas. I'm a product of McAllen Public Schools. Uh, went away to get educated at summer school at UTPA before it became UTRGV, and I'm very proud to be a product of those institutions. Um, chairman and I guess I'm Chief Administrative Officer, Doctors Hospital at Renaissance, past president of Medical Association, so I bring a variety of perspectives to the table. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I want to go ahead and just get started with um, some of the questions that we've received prior to the panel. Um, 
as you know, uh, the viewers today are composed of administrators, counselors, and educators um, in various districts in this region. Um, one of the things that I want to start off with is the actual healthcare workforce need in this area and what the districts can do in order to properly pathway students into these careers and fields. So I want to start off kind of with an overview from uh, our workforce representative about uh, the area and the region. Now, we know that there's nursing shortages all over uh, the United States, and we know that there are shortages in Texas. Um, how does this region compare, or what can you tell us about this region regarding healthcare opportunities or employment for our students? Well, good questions. I'm going to actually, I've got some notes here because I'm real big. I'm not very big on numbers, so I don't want to misquote any numbers. So currently we have over 116,000 individuals in the Valley that are hired or employed in the healthcare industry. 82,000 of those are in direct health care, which is uh, at hospitals and providing direct services. And the other 33,000 are in related fields such as uh, health insurance and medical equipment. We are looking at a projected growth of 32.1% over the next 10 years in our region, which is way above the national wow. average. Did you say 32? 32%. Wow. Yeah, and the national average is actually 17%, and the state average is 23%. So you're looking at it's just a phenomenal growth here in the area. And it's across all uh, occupations from direct services to medical insurance and medical equipment. It's just, uh, it, it's just exciting how much the revenue is bringing in. We're bringing in $13.7 billion is the economic impact that the healthcare industry has in our region. 43% uh, of the new jobs between 2009 and 2019 were in the healthcare industry. Uh, we have 1.2 billion in goods and services that are uh, done here in the RGV that are uh, dealing with the healthcare industry. And three out of 10 empl employers, employees are in the healthcare industry here in the area. So it's amazing when you look at the growth and it's just 32 percent, like you said, it's just phenomenal. It's it's way almost double of what you're looking at the national average. So when we go out and my team goes out, one of the industries we always talk about with the school districts and the growth is healthcare, And we want to make sure that they understand that this is it's just growing leaps and bounds. Uh, we work with the school districts and talking about uh, a lot of school districts have certification pro projects coming out where they come out with CNAs, but it's a pathway. You come out with that and you go in. And as you mentioned, there is a shortage of nurses, uh, which I'm probably going to, we'll probably delve into a little bit later. But uh, again, I, I just want to mention there's a huge need for nurses out there right now. And so we go out there and we talk to the school districts and to the school, uh, to the students to let them know that this is actually a growing field and it, there won't be any difficulties in finding employment in this industry if they were to choose it as one of their certifications for school. And David, tell us a little bit about, um, so a lot of people don't know what Workforce Solutions is or what the Texas uh, Workforce Commission does. How do you work with school districts? So we have a school district that's never heard of the TWC or that hasn't had a representative visit. What is it that you do with the districts um, in collaboration to get that information out to the students? Well, that's a great question. Uh, first. I have to, um, there's a difference. Uh, we're not Workforce Commission, we're Workforce Solutions. Texas Workforce Commission is a state agency who, and we receive the funding from Texas Workforce Commission. Workforce Solutions, there's uh, 28 boards, I believe, in the state. We are board number 23. We provide services to Star, Hidalgo, and Willacy counties. What we do is, we were lucky enough to get a grant about four years ago where we have an outreach specialist group of five uh, and we go out to the school districts. Uh, we meet at the Region 1 with the CT directors, and we provide information on labor market. What are the jobs that are in the area? If they're not in the area, where can they find these jobs? Uh, we really look at empowering students with information as to making career decisions. If it's not here, where can you find them at? We also provide job readiness skills, uh, which is very it's high up on employers' lists. Um, a lot of uh, Students always think that the number one thing they need to know is some type of operating, some type of machinery. And in, in reality, it's really customer service. 
uh, showing up on time, these customer service skills, the job readiness skills that, that are lacking. Um, and so we go out there, we have a curriculum that we, we share with the school districts. We can actually, back in when we were actually doing this in person, we would go into the classroom, uh, take over the classroom for that one period, the whole day, provide this instruction in person. Right now we're doing this virtually through our Zoom and a Google Classrooms that we have. We've got everything online. Uh, we basically are just getting them ready with interview skill preps, uh, giving them information. And it's not limited to just the students. We also go out and talk to the educators to, to provide labor market information on reports. So that way, if they need to make adjustments to their certifications, they can do so based on our labor market information. And we also talk to the parents because, as we know, parents are always the, the, the biggest influencers on a student as to where they go and what fields they're in. So, so we so talk out, to them. So out of all of them, it's safe to say the healthcare science field is like the gold standard right now because it's the one that has the highest percentage of uh, available ready jobs for students uh, up, upon graduation. Yeah, okay. it is. That's uh, that's sums it all up right there. <laughs> okay, well we'll go back to you with a couple of other questions. Um, I want to move to Dr. Lettingham and just kind of tie in um, the work. So the school districts know that health science is you know in demand and that there's uh, high wage positions available. How do school districts um, reach out to the students and get them information that they need for a transition between, let's say, a certification or a degree, or where should they start? The starting point's always interesting, because anytime I <clears throat> talk with students, educators, especially the students, the first question I ask is, what do you want to be when you grow up? So I've really determined what their pathway is. We know that our students, way back when they're in eighth grade, they kind of have to start making a decision about what they want to be. So at that point, the education, and even before that, the exposure to the different healthcare fields has to be provided for the students. You ask a kindergartner what they want to be when they grow up, and you get answers like doctor, nurse, firefighter, GI Joe, police, mermaid, <clears throat> the fun answers. But by the time they get to eighth grade, they're starting to think about that next step, college readiness, and entering the healthcare field if it's something they're interested in, or maybe they're still exploring. But they've got to start that pathway early. And in terms of getting them ready to make that jump from high school to college or university, the conversation has to really be, what do you really want to do? So again, going back to the exposure to different careers. I mean, career days are great in elementary school, but we've got to have the interaction. We want students to come visit us on campus. We want to visit with them early on so they can get an idea of what it takes to be ready. But also, I think once they determine their pathway, they've got to be thinking about the end result and start backtracking from there. We know that if we have a ninth grade student who wants to be a physician, and I've had several, I want to be a cardiologist, and we start quizzing them, okay, do you know what, how much schooling that's going to take? what it's gonna to take to get to the first step and what do you do now? And establishing that pathway is gonna be critical. And I love hearing the fact that Workforce Solutions is not only meeting with educators but with the actual students themselves and parents because all of those different parties have to be at the table to help this next generation determine their pathway. And Dr. Lettingham, I know that when we talk to school districts and when we've talked to uh, some of the counselors um, and uh, teachers, when we ask them just in a general survey, like how many um, degrees do you think there are in healthcare that uh, UTRGV provides? Usually we get anywhere between five to seven. What is the real answer? Because when I found out, I was blown away and I said, what, you know? Um, so can, can you uh, kind of share with us? Right now at UTRGV, in the College of Health Professions, School of Nursing, School of Social Work, and School of Medicine, we are at 30 different academic pathways related to health and healthcare and growing. 30. 30. And in the next few years, we'll be adding at least four more at the higher end. We're getting ready to 
have a school of podiatry. Where these are just the brand new ones. We've got a doctoral program in audiology in the works. We have um, a couple of other advanced PhDs associated with medicine that are in different stages of development. We've got a doctor of nursing practice that's getting close to coming to fruition. We're also looking at a doctor of physical therapy program in the next five years at UTRGV. And those are at the high end. At the lower level, we're looking at adding programs in respiratory therapy. We know the market is changing and the entry level degree is moving towards a bachelor's in that field. So we're looking at expanding and offering that program in the future. And several others. So we're at 30 and counting now. That means 30 different pathways that end in high paying jobs. And it's great to hear those job numbers because often our students want to know, well, how much am I going to get paid? Okay. What can I do with this job? We know exactly where to send them to. But when we hear about that growth, the students get excited and the parents get more excited here in the Valley because they want to keep their kids at home. Right. So that's always a good plus to know we've got the job market there. And what's great, referencing some of the students coming in, if they're in a high school program and they're getting a certificate in uh, a CNA or a medical assistant, sometimes those certificate hours don't always transfer to the university. Keep that in mind, but that experience does. Right. And the idea that they're getting patient contact and medical experience makes them that much stronger when they get to our program so that we can put out a better product. Thank you. And just again, um, to recap for those of you that are listening in today, um, there's 30 different pathways for health science. Um, and I know that um, students aren't always going to be the physicians or the nurses, um, but there's other available options for them. And it's really important that as administrators and educators, um, we know what they are, so we can offer them to the students and really get them um, a chance to uh, see what's available. So moving over to our partners at uh, Doctors Hospital, um, I wanna uh, start with Dr. Cardenas and uh, just kind of talk about, for those viewers out there that are not familiar with DHR and the way that uh, DHR kind of uh, blossomed and grew in our community. Can you kind of give us a little bit of background on it? And when DHR was first formed, what what was it that drove the physicians to uh, to do that? So um, we have a limited amount of time this morning. <laughs> so I, I wish I could tell you that I could do it succinctly, but I'll try. Um, so what drove us in the beginning was, uh, to put it in perspective, uh, I was that eight-year-old child in a third grade classroom that made his mind up to become a physician when I was eight years of age. In order to be able to achieve that, I needed to find a place to be able to go to school. There were no medical schools here then. There were no programs here then. And on the health side, if we look back, we had very few, if any, subspecialists. I had a younger brother afflicted with spinal muscular atrophy. We needed to go to UTMB in Galveston to get a diagnosis and think about treatment and therapy. Speech therapy was in San Antonio. Everybody picking up on a pattern here. Uh, that was the issue then. So when I think about what drove us to do what we did, it made perfect sense to me that we needed to come up with a paradigm that would change the landscape. This community was after building a medical school for 70 years. And we needed a clinical campus to be able to do that. We weren't thinking about a medical school when it first started, but we were thinking about patient care. And there was no better way to come up and build a system to deliver excellent patient care than the people who deliver the care making the same decisions that were necessary to build the institutions, facilities, policies, and procedures that would make it possible to care for that population and a population that we knew very well. Having been born here, fourth generation of my family born in this county, my family going back nine generations, I had a bit of perspective about what it meant not to have certain availabilities. 
and in order to be able to get educational opportunities to leave the area. So when we embarked upon the idea of making things happen, it made sense that physicians would be in charge not only at the bedside but at the boardroom working with our team of allied health professionals at every level to be able to deliver excellent patient care and then translate that, what I like to call the greater bedside, to our community where we could build the careers, build the opportunities for our uh, community members to join us in caring for our same patient population so that we could take care of our abuelitos and abuelitas, our tios and our tias, uh, all of our families. And um, that if we embarked upon that and we were able to bring the medical school and make those things happen, that we would see a transformation. Well, I can sit here today and tell you after listening to David and to Dr. Lettingham that that transformation has happened. Everything that we thought would happen has come to pass. We've been there as an institution every step of the way in providing educational opportunities, not just by mentoring and allowing shadowing opportunities for our future physicians, our future nurses, and other allied health professionals at every level that it takes to deliver uh, high quality health care because it was until we were here 250 miles to find comparable care and that's no longer the truth you can stay home and get that level of care right here and it made sense that because our area is afflicted with special problems that to some degree are unique in our population because we have higher prevalence that the man sitting next to me has helped us to build the research programs to find the answers to the problems that plague our community and we were recently put to the test, and like I said, we're limited on time today, but the COVID pandemic has brought so many things into focus. And all I can say is thank God that we made some of the things happen before it came because we were well positioned to be able to handle what is a calamity uh, that afflicted this population uh, three times in terms of mortality as it did in other populations in our state. Um, so. And Dr. Cardenas, I just want the viewers to understand your time frame because DHR is not 50 years old. It's not 100 years mm -hmm. old. Um, it was an idea that was built and really an engine that kind of uh, took off. You know, what, what is the time frame we're looking at from when you started to what you have now? Right, so we opened our doors as an ambulatory um, surgical facility in 1997, made the decision to become a hospital and opened our doors as a hospital in 2003 uh, with the first 30 beds and then we were adding beds or service lines every six months until a moratorium uh, was placed and then we could no longer expand or grow. And we're a 500 plus bed facility now offering every single uh, specialty uh, 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 to our population. At the same time, uh, we were on parallel tracks uh, to build uh, the infrastructure that would be necessary, and that means building the graduate medical education programs and the other things that have continued to grow uh, to be able to provide uh, the avenue uh, and the infrastructure, if you will, to make it possible to bring a medical school to the Rio Grande Valley. And we were partners in that, uh, both at what we could do from the human capital side, facility side, uh, bringing that, that to the fore, that at the same time, uh, we were able to provide the uh, political support and legislative support that was absolutely necessary or wouldn't have happened uh, to make it all happen. Uh, I've sat on panels for years, and I remember sitting on panels when we didn't have a medical school, and we dreamt about having a medical school, and we dreamt about opportunities. And I'm very happy to say, I'm very happy to be sitting here today having a conversation about the things that have changed and happened and the transformation that's happening right in front of our eyes uh, that we predicted would occur all those years ago when it was a dream to have graduate medical education programs training the next generation of physicians, the next generation of surgeons, bringing a top-level trauma unit to this area that is physically 
demographically, geographically isolated, removed from a lot of the rest of the state and the nation for that matter, and working in, a, in an area with challenging uh, socioeconomics and socioeconomic demographics, uh, and, and bringing all that together uh, to watch it happen. Uh, and having been told over and over again how certain things probably wouldn't happen, or we needed to have a blue ribbon committee, or we needed to have this, or we needed to have that, and we said no, we were committed to vision about what could happen, what can happen, what will happen here. And I was very pleased to hear David talk about some of the workforce needs that right now are more acute than they have been. Uh, nursing shortage existed prior to the pandemic. The pandemic has made it significantly worse. We need every person, we need all hands on deck because this is still one of the fastest growing MSAs in the country with an average, or I would say, median population and age of about 28 uh, to 26, and growing. I mean, we at this facility deliver a very large elementary school full of children every month. Our area delivers a 5A high school of children uh, every month. Uh, and those are daunting statistics when it comes to educating and keeping that population healthy and creating the opportunities. We have the mental capital right here in the Rio Grande Valley to do and achieve all we can do. And we thank all of you in the audience for building the curricula that makes those things happen. We've got lots of exciting things that are happening. Um, it's not by mistake that we have STEM fields growing as well with the culmination of what's happening at SpaceX and what's going to happen in the future as we see this congruence all happening at one time. It's an extremely exciting time to be down here in the Rio Grande Valley. Thank you, Dr. Cardenas. And moving to Dr. Rao, um, there's a lot of, uh, I guess that there's just a, a lot of misconception regarding research in this area and the fact that perhaps we don't have enough research, we don't have researchers, we don't have the capacity for research, um, but yet there's a lot of ingenuity in what you guys are doing here at the hospital. Can you tell us a little bit about um, research in this area and the potential for um, students to go into fields that are health science but perhaps aren't nurses or doctors, but maybe our research. Correct. So um, what you just said was probably true about a couple of years ago. I think uh, the leadership at uh, DHR, particularly Dr. Cardenas and his uh, leadership, um, put together a vision to uh, bring a, together a research institute, which is a non-for-profit institute. Uh, I was, uh, I'm uh, honored to be the first president, the founding president of that institute. And what we have been able to do is basically transform uh, the entire thinking about uh, clinical research in this particular region. As you very well know that nationally, only 1% of uh, Hispanics uh, in actually take part in clinical research. And most of what we learn and uh, transform for the treatment of Hispanics is actually coming from uh, in, uh, ethnicity, which is non-Hispanics. To some extent, it's cultural. There is a we have we are learning that it is actually a, a cultural barrier um, for them. The sum is actually not uh, providing them with education in a timely fashion. Uh, it is ironic what I'm about to tell you that uh, to some extent, COVID actually helped us in our region um, because uh, a lot of people very quickly realized the importance of getting engaged in clinical research. So when I said that we have about over 4,000 people who have received uh, transfusion of convalescent plasma and have recovered, uh, that meant that we have actually touched the families of 4,000 plus people and the entire uh, sphere of influence that they have. Um, we have, uh, when we started a monoclonal antibody uh, treatment program at DHR, um, we have now uh, touched the lives of a uh, little over 1,200 families uh, in treating. So I think it is ironic, but now we are seeing a, um, a sea change in the behavior of uh, 
of the, the re community in getting engaged in research. So we are seeing much more people getting engaged in research as, as a, as a uh, su research subject. But we are also seeing many more uh, individuals getting involved in the professional uh, side of actually conducting research and realizing that now clinical research, we are the largest clinical research enterprise now uh, south of San Antonio. And we are very proud of the of fact that uh, DHR gave us that platform to actually bring it to the valley. Uh, but I think what we are now working on is uh, trying to find pathways for uh, students to get into clinical research. Right. And uh, so we are actually putting together an R25 grant to the NIH uh, where we would be exposing high school students to clinical research, giving them uh, summer camps in our research institute, exposing them to various uh, uh, different uh, areas of clinical research from from data science all the way to actually accruing patients so that they actually understand uh, what it uh, takes to be a clinical researcher and how involved and important that process is. And let me ask you something because I know that uh, this is probably going to be one of the questions. For a student that, that is interested in clinical research, is there certain courses that they have to take or is there a certain degree that they should get at their bachelor's or um, is it just a mixed bag? I mean, yeah, it's a mixed bag. I think uh, it would be, so there is a different levels of uh, getting involved in clinical research. Uh, you can get involved in clinical research as a physician. Uh, you can get involved in clinical research as a nurse practitioner. Uh, but most of our clinical research coordinators are individuals who have, taken, have done bachelors with some interest in sciences, biology. Um, Although we have a couple of coordinators that uh, are came from arts, uh, from background in liberal arts, and they are outstanding coordinators. So it's really a mixed bag. Uh, I wouldn't actually um, create uh, put a label to what they should have in undergraduate education to become a, a clinical research coordinator. I see. And Dr. Luddingham, um, kind of piggybacking off of Dr. Rao, is there a program for? Um, clinical research or researcher or or we I know you talked about having a degree or um, a program for students that still hadn't decided what they were can you kind of talk a little bit about that well we've got a couple of different options <clears throat> at UTB probably about 12 13 years ago we started a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Sciences and that program was designed with two things in mind. There's a large group of students that wanted to go to med school and they kind of wanted a different pathway than going biology or chemistry or something like that. There was a spark of research, interest in a group of high school students, and the faculty at UTRGV at the time, back when Dr. Lecker, our dean, was actually the department chair of biology, kind of started building this idea for a need for a biomedical research program at the undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. But also, it's a program that was designed so that every aspect of their coursework is focused on human biology, and that really is propelling students and getting them ready for perhaps careers in the lab side of biomedical research because of the skills that they come out with, but also a group of those students do go on to medical school because that's their interest. And they've got other options as well. But a lot of our students today are coming to UTRGV and they want to go into nursing, medicine, other areas. And we know there's multiple pathways to get into medicine, but with nursing is pretty straightforward. You want to go into nursing and you want to get that Bachelor of Science in Nursing, you've got to declare that degree. And we know we don't have enough BSN programs in South Texas. The one at UTRGV is growing and changing, and has changed a lot in the last few years, but it's still highly competitive to get into that bachelor's program. So putting out a bachelor's trained nurse, we put out about 160 a year now. We know we want to do more, but we're limited by a lot of different factors, not just what we have in our region, but accrediting and things like that. And Dr. Lettingham, one of the questions that came up, and, and we're going to be opening it up for questions now, so 
If you uh, have a question for one of our panelists, if you can go to your chat feature, um, we're going to have one of the specialists um, write down the questions so we can try to get them answered um, as many as we can before the segment ends. So one of the questions was, for what is offered at UTRGV, where may a counselor, administrator, advisor go to see all of the health science programs? Is there a location where they can kind of peruse um, the different programs and figure out what they would like to have in their school district? Right now, UTRGV, our college websites kind of are three stopping points for the most information. We don't have a single website yet, but we are getting ready to relaunch a new website in the next few months that will encompass everything health-related, make it a little bit more, e a little easier. So whenever that does come out, I just want to make sure our viewers know that um, we do partner with UTRGV, and whenever that does come out, um, we will be happy to host Dr. Lettingham again and um, have all of that information uh, made readily available for the districts. Um, also on our PATHS website, we can link all of the UTRGV information and send it out to the district. So um, in case that was one of your questions uh, moving forward, we do plan to do that. So um, go ahead, sorry. Well, I say in addition to that, I mean, if we have students or teachers interested in getting more information about any of our health programs, a simple email is cohpinfo at utrgv. And any question about any of our health programs, we will direct it to the right people so you get a timely response. Because we know it's a two-way street and there's a, the opportunities that we've had with Region 1 ESC to kind of start our Pathways initiatives, that's just scratching the surface of what we want to do, especially in the College of Health Professions. We want to partner more closely with our middle schools and high schools, and even our elementary schools to do that career exploration piece, but to make sure you know what we're offering so that we can talk to you about what your students need to be doing to get to that next step. And there's a lot that we could go into, and that's a three-day conference. Right. No, and, and just getting back to that, we do have our Pathfinder Academy that's held yearly. Um, with UTRGV that has all of the updates of the school. Um, so stay tuned for information on that, definitely. Um, David, I have a question um, because I know that our keynote speaker for lunch is going to be Commissioner Julian Alvarez. And um, I know that just uh, two days ago or so, I think they uh, had check presentations for over 11 school districts totaling maybe $2.4 million. Um, how can the school districts leverage the Texas Workforce Commission um, for funding in these kind of uh, experimental or maybe uh, growing programs in health science? What do they need to do in order to tap into those funds? Well, the, that one you mentioned right now, and we're excited about that because that's probably the largest we've ever given out here in South Texas is the JET grant, uh, Job and Education Training Grant. Uh, that's specifically for uh, CT directors and, and uh, uh, programs, but if they're but interested in doing be, that. It could also be for nonprofits, right? The JET grant allows for nonprofits to apply for funds? No, that, the JET grant is actually only for school districts that have to partner with STC or a community college, but in this case, STC in our area. They have to partner and they have to, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. Because I know that the commissioner, and sorry, I don't mean to contradict you, but yeah. I know that one of the things that he was telling us during the check presentation is that through the legislative session or through the legislator, they now allow nonprofits um, to apply with the school district. That might be something that's coming up for this school, because the, the one that right. they awarded was awarded last year. Yeah. And so yes, we've, we've coming had a lot up of push. For this year. Yeah, we've had a lot of push for that. And this JET grant just got released about uh, a month ago for this current year. So it's a possibility that it's not a possibility if commissioner is saying that, then that's correct. Yeah, and one of the things that I wanted to talk to you, uh, you about that is because we do have, for example, uh, the Institute is a nonprofit. Is that's that correct. that's correct? And then we also have other nonprofits within the community uh, that do health science work that can partner with the school district. So to the school districts out there, if you have a program, let's say that um, your program 
involves nursing or that it involves research. If you find a nonprofit to partner with, then the application for that would be for a program that you would then um, have partnered with an institution. And um, just to give you an idea, you know, we've worked with Doctors Hospital probably the past 10 years. Um, and we've received about six different grants, um, totaling about seven or eight million dollars. But it's a partnership between the hospital, Region 1, and the school district. And, and I just want to uh, open your mind up to some possibilities because, you know, we, we talked about research. Dr. Rao talked about having students being able to uh, be part of the research experience. Um, and we have to think outside the box and be creative when we're looking at these types of grants because our strength has always been to make do with what we have and be creative on, a, on these programs. So just an FYI, I think that this is a great opportunity for the districts to think about those types of grants. But what kind of uh, equipment or what is that funding available for? Well, the JIT grant specifically is to purchase equipment for a uh, and, and, and again, it could be anything from uh, nursing equipment to purchasing for the nursing uh, curriculums that they have. It just depends on the school district and what they want to apply for. Uh, there's also skills development funds grants that, that are available through the TWC. Uh, we also have special initiative grants that we help. Right now, we're working with uh, STC and uh, West Local ISD for a dual credit for LVNs. So if a school district has a project or something they want to to think about and want to possibly partner with someone, they can contact us and we can look at what grants are out there and walk them through it. Uh, there's really a lot of grants that come out and it's really to purchase equipment or to update some of the equipment they have, um, you know, whether it's uh, the, the, the circulation system for their welding and so forth. So it, it's just a, a matter of how the school districts write it, but there's definitely an opportunity for us to, to partner with the school districts and look into uh, different grants. And and we have taken advantage of it because I've, as you said the check presentations that were given um, this earlier this week mm -hmm. um, or last week on Friday uh, totaled up to 2.4 million and it was about 11 school districts is that right? It's 11 school districts down here in the area uh, from ranging from uh, Laredo to uh, Cameron which is the largest because if you look back about five years ago we probably only had one or two districts receiving that JET grant. And now it's just uh, everybody sees that and, and they understand the importance of the money and, uh, and, and strengthening their, uh, their curriculum with it. So we've got more applying and more uh, being issued and granted that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and besides, while I have the, the, the floor, I just want to congratulate DHR. Uh, when we're talking about employers. Uh, I was about to go there too. Yeah, go ahead. Since you've had Commissioner Alvarez coming in, uh, DHR was uh, awarded the Large Employer of the Year by the TWC Conference 24th, a conference that we had in the, the history of the 24, the 24 years, no, industry, no business down here has ever received it. So uh, kudos to, and congratulations to DHR for being the first one down here. And that just goes to show And I heard the they had the competition, the commissioner was saying was, I think, Amazon, or Amazon. they had... They had um, yeah, yeah. There was a, there was it was uh, some big names out there that they they beat out. So we're we're very excited. Amazon's one of them. Uh, so they beat. And what does it mean to be employer of the year? What do you need to have that? Uh, you, the opportunity to hire and, and a large number of uh, opportunities for employment, impact in the community, impact in the uh, amount of money that's spent in the community, generating business impact on the businesses. Uh, it's. Um, just the plethora of different things that go into the equation uh, behind it. And we nominated them, and we're just excited for them. Uh, it's just another another thing for down here in the South Texas that we've got the large employer of the year this past year or so. Perfect. I'm excited about it. So I want to open the floor. Um, I know that we've been getting some of the questions coming in, and I'm, I'm checking on my phone as I get some of the questions. Um, we have about 15 minutes, um, so if you have questions for our panel members, if you could send them. Um, if not, I think I'm gonna go and um, kind of continue the conversation that we've been having. Um, going back to DHR, um, Dr. Cardenas, what, what do you think um, it means in this region 
um, to be able to have a partnership, uh, a hospital partnering with school districts? And, and why is that um, advantageous kind of for both of you? So it's, uh, it's about providing the, the infrastructure, the human infrastructure that we need in a rapidly growing area at all levels of healthcare delivery and providing the opportunities and at the same time leading by example, um, providing that example possibility for mentorship um, to provide a, a, a venue for children to look ahead and see that all types of things are achievable if you put your mind to it and that today you can do it all without leaving your community. Um, and so that provides an incredible opportunity that I think in at least going back two generations was not so easily available. Uh, so that, that gives me a lot of optimism for the future um, because you have an opportunity to grow up in a community, understand your community, see the issues and problems in your community, take that knowledge, get your degree in your chosen field and come back and use that to make this a better place to live for all of us. And that's what this is really all about. And so it means partnering as a physician, it means partnering as a facility to provide and be that partner uh, in the education of the next generation of the people who will care for us and for our loved ones. And so it's just a natural part of what you do when you are totally engaged, completely engaged in the community that you serve. That's what this is all about. It's what's driven everything from the very beginning. Um, it, it, it's about all of that. And, and I'm, I'm trying to put into words what I feel in here because right. that's what I really, really understand. And to find the way to make it happen, it takes all of us on deck to make it happen. Every single one of us at every level developing the curricula to make it possible for us to have those bright minds come back and help us care for people every day and at the same time provide the job opportunities, creating a healthy community that creates more opportunities in other fields that wouldn't exist if we didn't have this. And so it's all together and it's about all of us pushing and pulling in the same direction. So can I just add to what uh, Dr. Sure. Patton has said? So when we were putting this concept together, I can, I've been looking at DHR from a distance. I was in Dallas before coming here. And I think this is not an organization, this is not a company, it's an idea that is growing and it continues to transform itself. And establishment of the Research Institute one was one of the catalysts for change that happened. But when we were putting this particular um, uh, institution together, we actually realized that we needed to create a pipeline of individuals who are going to be engaged in innovative research in the future because that is one of the areas which is actually which we might need it and it's going to grow. So we set up two centers within the institute. One is called the Center for Professional Development. That's for more advanced students who are already have certain ideas that what they want to do and they come and do a summer rotation with us of about eight weeks which is a paid internship by the way. We pay for that internship. There are four positions available every year, and it could be any time of the year. It could be in the summer, but they could also be in the fall and spring. Mm -hmm. So that's for more advanced students. But then we actually have created a center for education and training in research for Hispanic students. That's a center which is going to focus its entire effort into high school, from junior to senior high school, working very closely with middle school programs that exist here so that we can actually prepare the students not just for going into and becoming MDs or nursing and, and PAs, but also into PhDs, so that we can actually may, uh, retain the, uh, the, the brains that we have in the community. I call it uh, reversal of brain drain, yeah. which is happening here in the community. So those two centers, fully funded by DHR and DHR Research Institute, are actually we are now looking to and are working with the community. Your students come to us and do internships throughout the year. Uh, we have a number of students who are volunteers who come from UTRGV. So I think we need to, as Dr. Cardenas and as both of you have said, we need to create to 
amplify this pipeline and make it as rich as possible so that people have the opportunities to decide what they want to do for their careers. I think that, that that's perfect. And that kind of transitions a little bit into um, one of the questions I received regarding um, what to tell students about certifications. So there's a model um, that some of them say, don't get any certifications while you're in high school. Concentrate on school so then you can get a four-year degree. Then, then we have, well, we need to have employment because we aren't able to go to the four-year degree. We have to start with a two-year degree. Um, what do you tell uh, educators that are in that predicament? And, and when a parent or a student says, you know, I can't get a four-year degree, I have to start with a certification. I mean, um, is that okay? I mean, I, I know it's okay, but I think that a lot of people are, are hesitant in saying, well, they're not going to be a doctor if they get a CNA, you know, they're, but they can be. Let me speak to that. I, I think that whatever, you know, seed is planted, gets the opportunity to grow. Whether that's a CNA, working at the bedside, or being an orderly, I was an orderly in high school. And it helped me decide that I truly did want to do what I thought I wanted to do when I was eight years old. And it, it grew into what is today. Um, and back then, there weren't certifications for orderlies. Uh, but it grew into what is today my MD degree and the ability to do those other things. So anything is possible. But I think we have some opportunities to do some innovative things. For example, one that comes to mind because it's something that's so, so needed is if you have someone who has uh, really good dexterity and they have the ability to think in 3D and they have the ability to do so many things uh, conceptually and with looking at things in, in a way, ultrasonography, for example, is an excellent uh, way to have a certification in a technical thing that is so helpful that you can work at part-time and help to fund your education into college and on into professional school with that certification um, and that it is a true bridge that not only provides uh, invaluable tactile skills, spatial skills, understanding of anatomy that could so easily um, morph into a much greater career over time and at the same time provide the ability to fund themselves. Uh, because, you know, let's face it, the funding for school doesn't necessarily grow right. on trees. <laughs> uh, and but, we, have but, different, we have different perspectives from all of the different areas in the high schools. Like, some of them will say, well, it's, it's better if they get some dual credit. Well, no, it's better if they get an associate's. Well, no, they really need to get a certification. And it's hard um, because I think that whatever brings a student closer to their career or their dream career can start off as a certification and, and that that's okay. Right, um, and, I, and I think you have to think of each of these uh, allied health uh, tracks that some that are certifications uh, that that they, they that they not be seen as the goal as the end but rather a stepping stone to so many other things and and so I think all of those things are possible I know when I've had the opportunity to speak to to those uh, those institutions uh, that that's what I talk about I said sitting in this audience today of uh, medical assistant graduates or certif certifica certifications is, is, an ex is another physician, is another nurse, because it's not necessarily the end goal, but it could be a stepping stone and they should look at it that way. But that if they're happy doing that, then that's fine. But I think that as you move on, it's certainly possible, and I think we need to approach it at, in that way, that it's a bridge. And Dr. Lettingham, I know that you mentioned that some of the certifications for the four-year programs, they don't transfer. You know, they, they aren't uh, stackable. If somebody gets a, a, a farm tech certification, it may not be um, transferable or the credits may not. But as you mentioned before, you believe that it's still very useful. Yes, I think that experience and starting out, I mean, 
I myself had different dreams growing up, but I started out and I worked as an EMT, worked my way through college. So I started out in that field and ended up in health education. But with these different certifications, they are offering great experiences to our students and they're getting that interaction with patients, with administrators, with physicians. They're learning how to work as part of that interprofessional team that we're trying to build throughout the valley. The healthcare of tomorrow is not just one physician with a couple of nurse, it's something much larger. So those certifications simply add to experience. And at UTRGV, knowing that the job market is ripe, knowing that we've got shortages, we are doing everything we can to shorten time to graduation. So we have students who, if they are coming out of high school and they want to go to university, if they've got a really good plan in place, we want to move them as quickly as possible, give them the best education we possibly can so they're ready for that next big step. And if they come in with a medical assistant and a year of experience, great. If they come in just with the certifications, they finish up their senior year in high school, that's a stepping stone as they jump into our programs they know a little bit more, and I think they're a little bit more ready for that next experience. But I don't ever want to say, don't hold back. Now with dual enrollment, that gets to be a little bit trickier, because the thing to remind all of our students with dual enrollment is, if you're doing dual enrollment, those are college hours that count. So those dual I just enrollment wanna, hours. I just, wanna, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that, because I think that that sometimes is confusing. So those are college hours that count toward a degree at the university so they matter when you're looking at you know grades they matter at grades and if a student doesn't do well in a dual enrollment class in high school and they have to repeat it if they have a dream of becoming a nurse that could ding them at utrgv because we don't want to see students repeating lots of classes if they take dual enrollment science and if it's not the right one they need in their future application to med school they may have to retake it but we'll let them know that we're not going to hide it so we kind of want to make sure they make smart decisions early on and in that junior and senior year when they start that dual enrollment experience they've got to be ready and i have um some other questions uh, for dr rao um i know that you talked about um programs uh, particularly maybe summer programs or uh, programs for students that want to be volunteers. Um, if they do, you know, if we have a district that does want to reach out and um, find out more information, who should they contact? So uh, we have got two individuals. One is myself, um, so they can contact me, or they can contact, uh, we have a, a person, a PhD level individual, who is actually the director for the Center for Professional Development. Uh, they can actually contact her and uh, she can actually then identify which program would be best to partner with that particular uh, school district. Perfect. And for the school districts that are out there, um, please know you can reach out to myself and to our education specialist, uh, Isela Herrera, and we'll be happy to get you in contact with any of our panel members uh, with their email in case you have any um, other questions. Um, I know that we just have a little bit of time, so if we could just have a closing uh, from each of you uh, to kind of sum up uh, what your advice would be to the individuals out there today and um, also uh, for our students. Uh, we could start with David. Sure. Uh, for the school districts and professionals, just feel free to reach out to us for any uh, type of the labor market data if you're looking to make any decisions on certifications and uh, growing occupations for students. Career exploration, go out, look at different, uh, one of the things we always hear when we go out and talk to the kids, I want to be a doctor, but they don't know what kind of doctor. Do they want to specialize in cardiology and so forth? Look it up, do the career exploration, get out there, talk to people, talk to your counselors. That's our advice, uh, that I can, that's the best advice. Get out there and see what's out there. Because there's a growing field, as you can hear from this panel, it's growing. It's just uh, where you thought there was five degrees and people think there's five degrees, there's 30. Yeah. So it's, you need to go out and ask questions. And the more you know, the better you're going to be to make those decisions. Go ahead. My only bit of advice for the educators out there is make connections with the university folks, not just admissions and financial aid, but with the 
different academic departments, the dean's offices. In the College of Health Professions, we want to visit with you. We want you to come to our campus. We want to go to yours. We want to expose students to college in as many different ways as possible, but we can only do that if we have a conversation with the educators, the students, and their families. It's going to take all of us together to get this next generation primed and set so we've got the high quality doctors, physicians, and allied health providers to take care of me because I don't plan on leaving the valley. <laughs> I'm going to retire here. I want a good doctor. Go ahead, Dr. Lau. So uh, my only advice to uh, the uh, students and to the parents and to the teachers is that uh, to getting into a professional uh, degree today in medicine or in health sciences is a very competitive field. Just getting having good grades is not going to get you into uh, that particular profession. You have to um, I identify yourself and your aspirations in many different ways in addition to good grades. And I keep on telling all the individuals who actually go into medicine or into nursing is that get involved in research. Make sure that you your application uh, is different from the 15,000 applicants who are going to apply for 100 seats in a medical school or 10,000 candidates who are going to apply for 160 uh, seats in a nursing school. And one way you can de-identify and make yourself uh, more visible is by doing uh, uh, research. And that is what we are trying to get uh, our uh, uh, students who are interns. But more importantly, publish it. It's not just getting the experience that I have been for four months in a research institute, but publish it. And that is what our goal is, that we have actually our own uh, online um, uh, journal, and we actually encourage the interns to write a case report about a patient that they have seen and publish it in, in that particular journal. So they have on their resume a publication or a presentation that they have made. Perfect. And Dr. Kadvina? So, you know, as, as I think about uh, everything that you all as educators uh, do, people who uh, form curricula, make it possible for us to have the talent uh, to, to come up with the next generation of caregivers and community members. Um, I want you to think about things that are innovative. I want you to have ideas that we haven't thought of yet that we could implement and we could help you implement by providing the clinical experience and the clinical side to whatever it is that you're thinking about. And it's never too young for a student to start because you can plant the seed when they're very young that can grow into all kinds of great things. And so what I would ask of you is bring us your ideas and come talk to us because we're your partner. Help us to, to make it happen. Uh, visions and dreams can truly become reality. Thank you so much everyone for joining us in our healthcare panel today. Uh, we want to thank our speakers. Uh, we want to thank our partner DHR for hosting us here at the hospital. Um, and we're very happy to have been here today. Uh, we will answer any questions that you have and let our partners or panel members know if you have any additional questions. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.